everyone, welcome to the AI show. This is Hello, very- everyone. <laughs> my name is Aisha Gula. I'm one of the cloud advocates, and my friend B here. Um, I'm also a cloud advocate. <laughs> and this is going to be a very special episode. We are super excited about this one. I think it's going to be my favorite, I know. Uh, we have Caleb, uh, who's a 13 year old, who um, were able to detect uh, fungal pneumonia from the sensors, and we're going to talk all about it. How are you? I, I agree. I think this is going to be my favorite show so far, also. I really have a good feeling about it uh, because Caleb is the youngest uh, guest we've had on the show. And we ha- also have uh, Benjamin Kabe. Yes. I'm not saying that correctly, <laughs> but uh, say hi. And uh, he speaks French. Uh, he's from France. So say hi. Who is here? Come. Yeah. How, uh, who's here? Tell us where you're from, your name, what you want to see in this show, what you're expecting. Hi, hi. Ahmed. How are um, you? Ahmed says hi. Uh, I'm going to add uh, Benjamin and Caleb. Hi. Bonjour. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was my day. Oh, we have everybody. All right. Yeah. Uh, so do, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Microsoft. <laughs> Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm Benjamin Cabé, or Benjamin, you, you, you had it right, actually. Uh, based in France, working um, in the Azure IoT team uh, on all things uh, open source, open hardware, tiny ML, like we're going to talk about today. And yeah, I love to talk to developers. I love to create uh, cool demos, tutorials, and um, yeah, really excited to be on the show. Yeah, and you might know him from the cover of Make Magazine <laughs> recently uh, with his demo, right? That's um, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, you want to introduce so... your project first before uh, we add Caleb and talk about his. Uh, yeah, I can briefly uh, talk about the, the history about uh, that particular project. Uh, yeah, I think we. Uh, some of you joining today, you might be joining for this, right? You've heard in, in the teasers on Twitter or on, um, on social media and stuff that we're going to talk about artificial noses. Um, uh, what's that? Um, well, in fact, um, I've, like, I'm a software engineer and I've been, um, for some reason, artificial intelligence and neural networks and all the maths behind it. Uh, this was just too complicated for me, like uh, for, I guess, decades almost i've been trying to learn it and to understand and it was always going over my head so when uh, the pandemic uh, started um like like many other people i had lots of time on my hands and i wanted to perfect my bread recipe and i thought maybe i could use uh, sensors to smell my sourdough starter and somehow uh, train an ai to tell me when the sourdough starter would be perfectly ripe and uh, yeah, using some open hardware, Arduinos and things like that, which I'm sure actually Caleb might explain even better uh, than I could. Um, I ended up just like building a device that uh, not only uh, uh, like acquires data from sensors, but use these data um, um, to like have the data go through a, a neural network, which now I kind of know what it is at least i learned a bit in in the process and uh, yeah it can uh, it can make um predictions predictions in terms of yes your sourdough starter is is okay predictions um as in uh yes your coffee is fresh versus your coffee uh, is not so fresh or like or maybe it can also smell and detect pneumonia which um uh, is Pretty amazing. Um, so, but yeah, it started as super uh, silly, I guess, experiment because it was uh, all around uh, red and just like uh, uh, just a random yeah. excuse for me to learn about AI. This project needed a thirteen-year-old to get some seriousness. And mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, yeah, exactly. Red is serious. I think yeah. red is really important. <laughs> I mean, I'm French. I, of course, I do bread. <laughs> I love bread. Yeah. yeah. Caleb, so nice to have you. Can you Thank you. It's up? amazing to be here. Um, anything in particular you want me to talk about? Well, um, what grade are you? Where so you I'm in. Cur- I'm currently in eighth grade. <laughs> um, 
I can't really say anything more personal about school. (laughs) Um, Lots of things like the science project and the robotics. So tell us about that. So let's start with why I kind of really started off with the science project. I primarily really wanted to begin this because, well, (laughs) I had pneumonia when I was nine. Now, I was A, first misdiagnosed when I had pneumonia, and I was given the wrong antibiotics. <laughs> so it was kind of a not very fun experience. And I thought, you know, if I can find something to identify the type of pneumonia much, well, quicker, then we can treat it quicker and save time, lives, money. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. And do, do you think you were particularly unlucky or is this, did you uh, figure like, that it's actually quite common for pneumonia to be misdiagnosed? Um, It actually is really a case to case thing. It would be, it can be misdiagnosed due to people not having medical records for it and or people or um, not getting a proper testing actually for pneumonia. Because when I had pneumonia, uh, doctors ran and uh, uh, like you know lung checkups, diagnostics on me. The, basically, the regular stuff they do to find anything, and I claim out as I had nothing. And really, the people. Give me a second, please. I just people. wanted to mm-hmm. tell this story while you're telling that. Like I had asthma for years and years, and I had bad experiences like it was really hard to communicate how bad it was um but i never thought about solving it (laughs) with technology so we are we are really impressed that you know you thought about because of your what you went through you thought about uh finding a solution to it yeah and so we we briefly chatted over the, the the past few weeks um You've not even uh, started to uh, to learn uh, how to code, right? And yet yeah. you've. Uh, so, do you want to like? Do you want to tell us more about like the um, the device that that you built? Oh, yes, and and because I, I mean, yeah, it turns out that um, um, and you t- you told me that there's some uh, recent research I think where um, like some uh, doctors and some researchers have uh, figured that um, there might be some uh, markers, some uh, volatile organic compounds that that might be, um, um, uh, that could be detected in, in the breath of someone who, sh- who suffers from, from pneumonia. And that's that was your starting point, right? So yes and no. My actual starting point, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go through the very beginning of this. <laughs> My actual starting point in terms of the project was Well, I wanted to first actually identify the metabolic signature of bacterial pneumonia and possibly get a baseline for something like the Xenos to be able to sense it. And unfortunately, but fortunately at the same time, (laughs) I um, got denied access to it. So um, I kind of just went on and started looking into other solutions. I had to pivot in a sense. So eventually I came across an MIT study about dogs being able to sense cancer. And that said MIT study making a e-nose themselves, which was apparently 200 times stronger than the dog's nose, but they were missing a core component, which was, it was a lot, apparently they actually said it dumber <laughs> than a dog because they couldn't sense all of the VOCs that really made, made up its surroundings because they're just getting the data, but not being able to process it. So, what is it? Actually, I can we explain. Sorry, pardon for people who are not familiar. What is VOC? So a VOC is a volatile organic compound. B, it's basically a compound that contains traits of volatility, meaning it is non soluble in water and it has a boiling point lower than room temperature and is organic in nature, meaning it's carbon based. Ultimately, when I got done on researching the MIT study and finding you know what an enos was, I came to another study that detailed the metabolic signature of fungal pneumonia. And it was done by actually someone, uh, a colleague of my aunt who worked on it. His name is Dr. Sean. Um, he 
worked on identifying the metabolic signature of fungal pneumonia. They came out with basically four distinct compounds and or monoterpenes that made up fungal pneumonia. Those being limonene, bigamentine, why am I blinking now? Limonene, bigamentine. Even if you remember, I wouldn't know when. I know. Lemonine, <laughs> <bigamentine. laughs> Lemonine, bigamentine, pinene, and I believe it was camphene. So these essential things were basically markers for being able to identify what makes up fungal pneumonia that can be sensed by this enos. So basically the, the primary reason I actually want to do this also is the current methods for identification of pneumonia, the type of it, which is it takes very long to even identify that you know someone has pneumonia and then on top of that it turns out that you know the current procedures we have for identifying the top even the type is very difficult because we have like something like sputum tests we have, have um like basically a, another thing i'm i'm blanking on the names like um it's a long something Anyway, okay, but uh, the primary one that I was actually interested in for the methods is gas chromatography, mass spectrography. I, and let me elaborate why that is actually one of the most important ones in terms of my project's category, which is gas chromatography, mass spectrometry is a process in which you can identify all of the compounds to make up something. Primarily, AI would be, would be focusing on the volatile organic compounds of full pneumonia. And those tests take a very long time, but they're very accurate due to once, you know, medical databases have very specific, well, basically markers, I guess, <laughs> for um, the type of pneumonia, uh, they can identify it. It is amazing. Um, I mean... Um... How, how did you even start learning about this? Uh, before I, you know, Benjamin was uh, on the cover of Make Magazine, I didn't even know that you could uh, sense that and with machine learning, you can understand. So you know, it really began about a couple of months before my science project began, which was, well, I recently learned, I had the idea of floating around, which is, you know, dogs can sense cancer. And I was like, huh, that's smart we should be able to do something like that. And I also got into the motivation from a previous science project that I heard about, which basically had these medical sutures that would change color based on pH, identifying if someone had an infection. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, so you can have something that's sensing another thing and displaying information in some form. So I was like, that's really cool. I wanna make that. Once I had really gotten into well, that, I also remember another component, which I think everyone here should know, how, um, it's a breathalyzer. So I thought uh, of a breathalyzer, which is, you know, smell into it, get the blood alcohol level of somebody, and I'm like, maybe I can do something similar with that, with disease. So then that led me down to the rabbit hole of, of you know, gas chromatography, mass spec, or GCMS, I'm just gonna kind of shorten it because I'm kind of twisting my tongue whenever I say it. <laughs> um, but that kind of led me down to the world of GCMS and then eventually ENOSES, then the MIT study. And then I eventually found that basically the monoterpenes that make up fungal pneumonia, I actually recognized one of them from a TED-Ed video, believe it or not. And it was um, bergamotene, sorry. I get the pronunciation wrong all the time. <laughs> and this specific one was excreted by tobacco plants to attract parasitic wasps to defend it, actually, from caterpillar strain. I was like, I know this. This is a plant essential oil as well. So I started to look into other, basically, the chemicals that made up fungal pneumonia, and I found they were all plant essential oils. And I was like, okay, so I can get stuff available off the market that has incredibly large amounts of this stuff in it and or pure extracts of them. So I had basically 
taken that stuff from that I found <laughs> and use that as the test samples for what the stuff that made up from pneumonia. It is amazing. I know the science projects I've done and I'm um, not going to mention what they were. <laughs> and I know that your classroom might be watching this. So uh, just want to say hi to your class and to your teacher for supporting oh, you. Yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I'm very, very kind of that's the main thing I'm actually stressed about here, which is I don't know how many people are actually watching me. Because I might be like, oh, yeah, three people are watching me. And there's multiple classes. So I'm like, uh, watching me right now. I'm kind of stressed. <laughs> But they're all supporting you, right? in that sense. <laughs> they're all supporting you, right? They're they're kind of sending you good vibes, so uh, it shouldn't so. stress you out. It should it should relax you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, do you, you want to show us how it how it looks like? Maybe do you have like oh, I sure. think you have some some cool drawings. Um, and maybe yeah, we can, can talk more about the, the, the sensors and stuff. Design. Do you want to share your screen now? Yeah. Okay, I can't. Really this is tell. my screen. Oh, sorry, yeah. that is your screen. <laughs> really tell. My bad. All right, so this was the original sketch of the design. We, I did not follow out with this design, considering well, primarily a top part up here, actually, because I wanted it originally a chamber to, <laughs> believe it or not, have some cooling agent with it. As it says here, cooling in collection chamber with ice bath, possibly create an aerodized micro components for lower respiratory tract or oh my lord my handwriting is atrocious i'm sorry or <laughs> ubc exhaled breath anyway this is the original design it's mm -hmm. somewhat similar to what i actually have on another slide the current design i have and it is this is a wide shot of it so the mm -hmm. box on the bottom is the motor box top is the actual thing is the actual artificial lung and that's the pro there's two primary things this serves a being to well pump an artificial lung and b to keep me away from the toxic chemicals but the main reason ultimately would be this sensor here so mm -hmm. that i can actually get readings go into the sensor and allow it to read i actually originally wanted a 13 sensor array i'm just actually reconstructing it right now but due to time's sake um, I couldn't really recompile everything to have a 13 sensor array. Um, so so I'm what, is, Pardon? what is the advantage of having a 13 sensor array? So Why? multiple actually studies have shown, you know, we have very specific. <sighs> oh, I, okay. Yes. So there was actually a very specific study done. I had to do with another Enos model, not the not the MIT one, which was that had a Raspberry Pi, actually, for that one, in terms of the microcontroller it used. And uh, what was it? It was used to measure renal disease or basically kidney failure. So it measured the ammonia through someone's breath. And it was able to identify not just the ammonia levels, but a bunch of other distinct levels of things that would tell, yeah, this guy's having kidney failure, they're dying right now. <laughs> Basically, you have more information about. So yes, yeah. it gives me the more information, the more very distinct things I can have, the, the better for my sensors. So basically I would have either a 13 through 16 sensor array, I'd probably say 13 just for clunky at sake of these are basically just different companies I wanted to say the names are kind of funny, like Adafruit, mm -hmm. five seat sensors there's but i mainly had time constraints in terms of what i could do mm -hmm. and you know i'm still developing the larger sensor array and so in the in the introduction i was mentioning that uh for me, when I started playing with the, this idea of an artificial nose, it was mostly as an excuse to learn more about AI. Yeah. Uh, I would love for you to um, explain with your words and the way you, you um, ended up understanding uh, the AI model, like what is actually happening? With, uh, they, so there's sensor data in the form of uh, gas concentration, I guess, right? That, that's being so, picked up by so the... So the sensor data is, it's not just gas concentration. It's basically the raw gas, basically everything around it that it can sense, it will sense. So how much compared to 
basically it's how much of that gas in parts per million of air. And that, and it takes these raw data. Actually, I can show you a different program I used to interpret that, which would be edge impulse here. It takes raw data, edge impulse that being, and this is the program I believe you used as well, Benjamin, correct? Um, and interprets it into actual readable things. So I think this is, this would be one of my graphs. Um, and edge impulse doesn't just serve for, you know, oh, fancy little cute graph here. It also serves for identifying, being able to deploy the model easier and being able to actually identify how efficient the model will be once it's on a individual device, such as the Wii terminal. And the primary purpose of that would be, you know, you can have an individual device that you can basically hold and get readings around you. And they can make an inference of, oh yeah, you know, I'm detecting focal pneumonia or I'm detecting, well, air or something. So mm -hmm. in my sense, so you, want to, you primarily want to understand how I understand the AI learning, correct? And when it comes down to the AI learning, it really comes down to the raw data and the numerical values of that set of data. When it comes down to okay. the... No, you know, I, I, I was about to ask, like, what what are the kind of, um, so we are looking at uh, Lyman in here, like, what are the kind of um, categories of things that you've, uh, you, you've trained the, the model to to recognize, I guess, the, the raw chemicals, but also... Um, so I have, had the, I like... have had the raw chemicals themselves. It's kind of lagging a bit, give me a second. I have had the raw chemicals themselves, or things that had contained large things of it. Where is it? I can't see it there. Mm, I think this is one of um, pine cypress, citrus, and carrot. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, for example, this is a, a full mixture of all of the chemicals I have, right? So that would be someone who is sick, pretty much. That's the yeah, sample. This would be, someone would be sick, right, with a strain of fungal pneumonia, right? And... A very specific strain, actually, let me interject on that, which would be invasive aspergillus, or IA, because I examined the most common form of fungal pneumonia inside of my project. Um, let's see. Okay. Pardon? Go ahead. Um. Oh. <laughs> um, now, basically... Kind of blinking here give me a second while you're gathering your uh thoughts actually there's one question that maybe benjamin you should uh, answer it. um does microsoft make um develop sensors that was one of the questions hmm interesting uh uh, not that I know of, or not uh, not sensors in the sense of uh, uh, sensors that would be uh, similar to the ones uh, used in um, the uh, the artificial nose, uh, but I guess for all things gaming, right? I mean, there are some. Uh, I don't know for a fact whether um, there are first party sensors developed by Microsoft, but there's tons of um, domains where it makes sense to have. Um, sensors, usually lots of sensors, and usually sensors that are uh, fed into AI models, right? How, how do you think uh, uh, movement recognition works uh, when you shake your uh, uh, your joystick or when, when you do um, some like augmented reality uh, uh, stuff using a HoloLens, right? You need really good um, um, LiDAR, sonar, uh, light sensors, uh, cameras right and, and feeding all those inputs into into an ai so that you can do either uh yeah gesture recognition or um things like that uh yeah i mean that's um um yeah ton, there's tons of sensors that can um that, yeah. that can be used for sure also azure uh, has ways of you know uh using that data right like um how to save the time series data and use it in a meaningful way and I was also thinking, like, uh, there's also the Azure Percept also that does have a few sensors, right? Like, I wonder, uh, Benjamin, does your team uh, own a Percept, or do you guys are you guys involved in that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that, and that's a good point. Like having, um, um, like, what we see more and more these days for uh, enabling. Uh, 
industrial IoT scenarios is this idea of having a, um, a device uh, that bundles everything that you may need for uh, monitoring a, um, a shop floor, for monitoring a, maybe a, a car, a truck. So you have essentially a, a box that's a computer, a ruggedized computer with um, um, like a trusted silicon uh, as in like the uh, whatever um, credentials, passwords, etc. Uh, you might need to connect to the internet, to connect to uh, to the VPN, maybe in the factory, things like that. This is all like super ruggedized and, uh, um, and, and very secure. And this comes also with the, the sensors, uh, like you mentioned. So uh, like you would have a super uh, HD camera out of the box, things like that. And this also comes with all the, um, uh, the software stack, all the, all the frameworks so that connection to the cloud is uh, native, if you will, right? I mean, you just need to uh, to, to provision the device uh, when, when you get it the first time, and then uh, it starts communicating uh, with the cloud, uh, sending sensor data to the cloud so that you can uh, store it and, and do your um, your data analysis on it, uh, since, um, I mean, communicates to the cloud so that you can also do uh, remote um, upgrades of the, of, of the software, right? When you start operating uh, a fleet of trucks, it's one thing to be able to to know um, remotely when uh, a tire uh, is flat or when like when a driver is is having an issue, uh, but it's even better if if it goes both ways and and if you can also from the cloud uh, send uh, send commands to to the trucks, uh, upgrade uh, the hardware to add new features to to improve the accuracy of the AI models, should you be using AI models for your solution? Uh, yeah, things like that. And I actually, uh, Caleb uh, has also started, I think, to look into those kind of scenarios where it's not only about building an AI model that is um, like good yeah. enough. Yeah, I mean, it needs, the model needs to be super accurate, ideally. It needs to be reasonably small so that you can embed it into a breathalyzer kind of device, right? Not a huge uh, computer with a, a GPU graphics card. Like you want something that's battery powered and that's small. And if you also get um, a package where you can also have internet connectivity uh, and leverage this internet connectivity to connect to an IoT cloud, then that opens the door to quite a few things, right, Caleb? Yes, it does. So actually, I think we should talk about possibly um, the network we have. Is this yours and those connected, by the way? It is, yes. OK. <laughs> so oh, also, hello, Eclipse. Um... So I have <laughs> Eclipse. Um, yeah, so yeah, we will show you actually a, d a demo of. Um, so this is my Enos. <laughs> is It's running the exact same model that Caleb trained in his room, right? So my. Uh, and I, I won't show you the screen, right? There is a screen right here, but you don't have to see the screen because we'll, we're going to leverage IoT for that, right? Like right now, my nose is smelling um, the ambient air in my room and um, it's sending data to the Azure IoT cloud. And so remotely, a so Caleb, you're going to pretend you're the doctor, right? And so remotely, the doctor can look at what the what the devices in the field can um, are, yeah, are sending essentially. And in my case, my device is sending the result of the uh, running the AI model, the, the AI inference. It takes the sensor data as an input and it's like, hey, it smells X. And uh, yeah, it smells X or Y or Z. And mm -hmm. really yeah. the primary thing, let's see. Really the primary yeah. thing is my vision is to possibly create a network of these all around the world, right? Because if we can if we can identify key things or the metabolic signature of human breath, then we can make diagnosis of almost everything so much easier. And we can possibly do that with networks like over here. If you can let me show my screen. Uh, How much does it cost uh, to have, let's say, if we wanted to distribute it all over, over the world, how much would each Enos cost? Each Enos? Um, with yeah. all the little, like, nice bells and whistles so far, it would only be about, like, Twenty to thirty dollars. Wow, that's wow. amazing. So and that's totally feasible. What you're saying? Out frequencies <laughs> are smell signals read. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you're referencing by frequency. 
if you mean the interval in time in terms of how often it's outputting data, it's updated basically every second. Yeah, and the uh, the, the model um, to to train the model. Um, yeah, you get a result every second, um, but the, the data, the, the the gas concentration uh, is sampled um, at ten hertz. So every uh, t ten times per second, um, the um, the device acquires uh, and measures the gas concentration of uh, with the sensor that Caleb is using. It's it's four uh, compounds. It's um, nitrogen dioxide. It's VOCs might be the most important one. Uh, <laughs> carbon monoxide and uh, ethyl alcohol. Uh, and so those um, essentially those. 10 samples that you acquire during one second, you feed them into uh, into the AI, you get a result. And uh, one second later, you get another result, runs, right? When, once you've smelled um, uh, 10 more samples. Uh, and uh, yeah, Caleb, did you want to share your screen maybe to show oh, us? Oh, sure, the, uh, yeah. Um, I'm, uh, is yours connected currently? I is it? I, I, I think it is, I hope it is. Oh, it is actually, yeah. <laughs> So I'm not entirely sure if my screen's being shared right now, but this is a Zorio T Central. This right here is basically, I just said it to last hour because I wanted to just basically condense it down to this. But this is the uh, live data reading from last hour. I turned it on, on and Benjamin turned it on at about the same time. So these current data points, <laughs> these current data points <laughs> represent in Benjamin's nose. Those and then all all the bells and whistles in terms of the data that is being outputted and just the raw numbers. Can we tell? Uh, right. So that's so that's not AI, right? That's just like the raw it's, it's, data. It's, go on. Sorry. Yeah. No, so so that's that the the idea here would be um, collecting tons and tons of data from devices in the field to potentially train better models. Right. Yes. Just, we're looking at the raw data. Yes, because if we can gather the raw data and then identify what the raw data basically means in a sense, then we can get a bunch of different data points that we can have. Uh, for like basically, let's say human, like the metabolic signature of human breath, or a new strain of COVID coming out that we haven't seen before based on previous signatures if we've observed them. Right. And right. I don't think I'm doing a very good job of actually explaining really the magnitude. <laughs> no, I think you do. Uh, I think you do. Uh, and and it's um, and this is. I mean, maybe I can jump in with. Um, I'm not sure I want to mention the, the metaverse, uh, but I can certainly mention this notion of digital twins, and uh, the um, yeah, this raw data that we're looking at. Um, one way to uh, to make it really uh, really useful uh, could be that. Uh, um, a, I mean, there is a device that is in in a, in, um, in a doctor's uh, room all day long, and yeah. all day long there's going to be many patients that all end up breathing into the into the device, and at yeah. the end of the day, Likewise. just by looking into the records of the uh, of the of the doctor, right, you you can know that oh yeah, uh, between one p.m. and and uh, and and one and a half, uh, this is. This was this patient who, who was uh, currently uh, there for an examination. So uh, those samples that we collected between uh, one and one thirty, we know that they uh, correspond to a patient that we think has uh, pneumonia or we think has something else, right? And we start labeling the data, and over time we can uh, we can yeah um, improve the model. And maybe what you can show as well is the devices view, right? Where we can also uh, more like in, in, in real time, we can see the actual um, results of the AI from my, uh, from my device, right? Because uh, can you guys guess what, what my device is smelling, right? Did, well, uh, I was wondering, is it coffee, coffee or whiskey? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Caleb, do you want do you want to show us in the, in the devices view? You know the um, um, uh, like my nose specifically, and yeah, and if you go on the about, yeah, right now it's smelling. <laughs> it smells. It smells like Caleb's room. I mean, it's been trained to recognize ambient air. Yeah, but that's and uh, yeah, I think as, as you can see, uh, it's been sent. Uh, 
it's been refreshed pretty um yeah my device uh, has been talking uh, and sending data just a few um, a few seconds ago right 11:35 i guess that's your time uh, pacific right yeah so I it is um, it is iot right i was wondering if uh, this could be used as a covid test like a cheap covid test that we could all have in our houses and so just yes into it once a day the entire <laughs> idea of this project really isn't just about you know, here, let me stop sharing my screen so I can actually see my face. Um, <laughs> um, the entire question about this is basically, it's not just, hey, can we identify one strain of fungal pneumonia? It's, hey, can we maybe, well, identify a bunch of respiratory diseases, right? Bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonia, COVID. In fact, um, if I remember correctly, a bunch of different corporations are been trying to work on an enos that can that can detect COVID because of how well it roots in our respiratory system. And exactly. so I actually have a friend that just just acquired a seven hundred dollar COVID device, COVID test device to have in the house so oh, that wow. they can get tested regularly without having to do the PCR tests, whatever. So you're talking about twenty to thirty dollars that we that we could all just have it home, not only to the test if we have it, but detect which strain we have it, and even better, I don't, you know, identify that we have a strain that hasn't been detected yet, and kind of communicate yeah. that to a hospital, or whatever researchers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like I want to jump in here uh, with regards to uh, yes, it's cheap to build the the, the device uh, as it is uh, today. Uh, the quality of the sensors uh, that you get uh, for. 20 bucks, uh, those are like off the shelf hobbyists, kind of grade kind of sensors. Uh, they uh, they might be uh, really accurate in, in some uh, situations. They might be way off in, in, in others. They're not necessarily like even advertised as being uh, uh, calibrated or, or anything like that. So you might need for some use cases um, sensors that are either more expensive, uh, but also uh, in the meantime, more um, uh, way more accurate, way more sensitive, or for some applications, and I think COVID would fall into that that category. You might need some sensors that just don't exist, right? I mean, the the electrochemical reactions, whatever, that are needed to build an electronic sensors that that detects such and such molecule. It takes time, and it uh, yes, AI can sometimes sometimes do wonders because you just start feeding data that come from, like Caleb said, 13 different sensors and you just make up for the, light, the lack of that one sensor that would do uh, the job on its own. But sometimes that just doesn't um, cut it, right? Um, yes, but may yeah. I? That's mm -hmm. the thing is we're using commercial sensors. Now, the brilliant thing about these sensors is the way they actually identify and process the data, right? Basically, it's all little electrical impulses they're taking from the environment around them um, and interpreting it as, oh, there's this much data in this air, this much data in that air. And a four sensor array, like, I think I actually, yeah, I can just show it right here. Give me the store. Oh, it's on my desk right here. Um, this little cute four sensor array right here, right? Mm -hmm. It can have the same thing on the same slide with, let's say, eight of these sensors of different functions. That can be an eight sensor array. So, and actually, he, um, Mr. Daniel, I'm going to call you if that's okay. I see you down there saying, <laughs> but just rely on chemical reactions so it's more complex. Yes, but the simplicity of this, or the presence of antibiotics, but yes, you're talking about the microbial realm. You're not talking about the actual VOCs that are being measured off and or, or the chemicals that are actually coming off of COVID. It's not exactly about doing a common test for it it's about developing a new way mm -hmm. and exactly. it will not, no it doesn't have to be more expensive if if the um sensors are more accurate it doesn't have to be i have these this metal oxide sensor very cheap very good readings ings but there is always there is a drawback you are right which is it has to be on for a while to heat up but once it is it has incredibly accurate readings yeah, and quite honestly, we're, we're talking $20, $30. Even if this went up to $100 for more accurate sensors, I would buy it, right? For just to have an always-on kind of COVID test that I can do every day, I would spend $100 on that in a heartbeat. Yeah, right? 
and, and when and you, have, you would still go and get the test, but it would sure. be cheaper. Yeah, exactly. And Jay's uh, giving you some business advice, Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I think I'm going to try to, but right now I'm well, I really make my project open source because I'm not really looking for money in this sense. I'm looking for helping people develop something that can be really great, that can be used around the world for something to just, well, help people get them done. Yes. I don't care if I yes. could make a billion dollars and not help a bunch of people, or if I can help a bunch of people, I would rather help the people because I know how bad, it feels very bad when I had pneumonia. I remember, <laughs> I, 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 I still am a hyper kid, but I used to be a lot more hyper. And when I had it, I would, I would always jump out of bed in the mornings, but when I got uh, pneumonia, the first thing I remember is I jumped out of bed and I just fell. I couldn't, I couldn't physically stand. It just, I don't know what it did, but it wrecked me. <laughs> Let's see. Might be much yeah. And, and I know that you were misdiagnosed and that's also, uh, happens pretty often and it's kind of very sad. Um, dollars might be a much for an American European or what about low income countries? That is actually one of my points. Yes. First of all, low income countries are actually the ones that are prosecuted with pneumonia a lot of the time due to people not and have some of the highest death rates because they aren't able to get access to the tests. But the reason is, is you need dedicated facilities to be able to process the data you get from the tests or interpret, you know, what's growing in them. They take large amounts of times. And most importantly, they can sometimes cost much more than a hundred dollars. <laughs> So I, I don't know how we're doing with, with time, but I have just so many questions uh, still. Uh, oh, yeah, one I had, time. Okay, cool. Time. Uh, no, one I had for, for you, Caleb, is uh, like what, uh, so far at least, what was the most uh, difficult aspect of the project? Like, I, this, did I, I don't know, you tell me. I, did not, I do not know coding at all. Yeah, I, 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 just, I was just about to, to hint at that, actually. So um, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. But, and I would say the actual like getting actually the parts of the sensors because I had said I had some of the um from how my PowerPoint presentation some of the sensors you saw some of those arrived yesterday <laughs> so supply chain issues yeah um right. are also yeah but problem interestingly you don't know how to code but still you've been able to to build the project, right? So that, that yeah, that's pretty cool. Was, and maybe because it was open source in the first place, it was open, uh, but it, it, was it also open. says something when it comes to uh, how much easier it is now to do um, embedded programming uh, for one, because I mean, like things like the Arduino, Wio terminal, uh, it essentially just works. Um, and uh, yeah, embedded machine learning as well. Like you've, You've been able to, to, to train a model. You, you haven't like you didn't write Python code. You didn't write C code. Uh, it just just worked. It just worked. But yeah. the, one of the primary things about this was, I would say, also tutorials, which is to someone that has no idea how to code when it gets into these things. Some of these things can be really daunting and kind of like oh. What is that? Oh, it's saying this term that I don't understand or this term that I don't understand. I kind of felt like that. It took me a little bit to somewhat, I have a somewhat understanding of what's going on. But I would say really getting the fundamentals and the basics for an individual subject would be amazing for people that are actually looking to go into this and start developing new things. And my vision is to basically be able to use, let's say, Edge Impulse in the future or programs like Edge Impulse, right? to be able to create appliances that can be basically someone's own personalized project. Like I had a kid in my class that, that wanted to, that wanted to get more sleep and well, <laughs> well, their cat was scratching at the door all day. So they used um, an Arduino sensor and some open source code to be able to do a motion sensor and basically have an automatic cat door, which I thought was funny. But just little fun, little individual projects for someone's own appliance, I think that would be amazing for a lot more people to learn about. And sure, there can be a sometimes difficulty, but it can be actually also very easy at the same time. And thank you, Benjamin, for making this available to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, inspiring. Caleb and yeah, so do, do, do I, well, so yeah, I, I wish Caleb, you, you would have said that you, you 
you're totally interested in being a billionaire and getting royalties because I would be like, hey, I want to get some as well. So, yeah, I'm totally with you. Uh, I'm totally with you. Um, I would have been really sad actually if you as I've said that. Um, yeah, no, that that's cool. Uh, speaking yeah. of uh, money and cost, actually, there, there's a question from um, uh, from Carlos, I think, um, and. Um, uh, I'm, um, yeah. if, if you guys want to show my screen real quick, uh, just like a short answer to the question, which is uh, how much would it cost to keep the project running in, in uh, Azure? The part where you connect the uh, the e nodes to um, to the Azure IoT cloud, so that remotely you can collect sensor data, so that remotely you can read uh, the um, what is the nose um, smelling kind of stuff. Uh, it's reasonably cheap, right? You can, uh, so this is, uh, the service is called Azure IoT Central and uh, there's different uh, tiers uh, depending on how many devices you expect uh, that you will be um, having and how uh, chatty, how much data you expect the devices to send. Uh, is this like only um, eight hours per day when like the, um, uh, the doctor's office is open or is this going to be 24 seven? Is this going to be uh, every minute or every second? But you get the idea, but and, I mean, you're, we are talking um, a few like tens of cents or a few dollars uh, per device and per month. And with that, you already do a lot. To that, you may need to add some costs in terms of you're interested, like Caleb was uh, was mentioning, uh, in doing things like collecting tons and tons and tons of data uh, over years and potentially decades so that you can uh, uh, build uh, super advanced AI models, then you will need, uh, you will have costs associated with that. But uh, yeah, starting point and a ballpark figure would be uh, just looking at those numbers for IoT Central, and I think it, it gives you already a sense of... Uh, uh, yeah, what, what would be the cost for the IoT, the pure IoT aspect of the solution? And possibly you could um, reduce the data, right? Like if you're not interested every, in everything and reduce the data and then send it, send it. Or is it just directly from the sensor? Yeah, yeah, the, that's uh, you're right. Like uh, the, the, the charts uh, and, and the graphs that uh, Caleb was showing, they look nice, like it's like there's lots of data uh, that's showing, but that's uh, also pretty stupid potentially because the, the devices every, like as of now, both my Inos and Caleb's, uh, they send every two seconds, they dump and they send to, to the cloud the readings for uh, from the, the four sensors. So that's four data points uh, every two seconds and those data points, they don't change that much. So it might make sense to have, um, just to your point, uh, have local consolidation on the device, compute some uh, key characteristics, um, averages and whatnot, and only every hour or so you send the, uh, uh, like, yeah, the key metrics and you, yeah, you, you, you cut the cost by potentially like a hundred, a factor of a hundred or something, because you just, uh, yeah, you don't bother sending data that's not really data, that data that's not really information, right? Yeah. Um, so we have here some some comments I just have to show. Caleb, you have you have a fan club watching you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and hello, Mr. Dev. How are you doing? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you have, hi, so yeah, I mean, I have like. I, Hi, fourth and third period. I know third period is gone, but a little fourth period. <laughs> you like this? <laughs> That's cool. So, what's so, next for your project? Like, you, uh, so you're going to try and play with the with the sensors? Oh yeah, uh, I, I, it's been kind of just fun being able to new play sensors. And I've been just actually looking around the different websites for, let's say, you know, Seed or Arduino, and they have a lot of interesting appliances that could actually be used to just let's say improve, well, my home, <laughs> um, you know, temperature monitors, humidity monitors, just checking stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Also, the, the, there's a there, question that I think has been coming up a, a couple of times. A bit, uh, which is, is, there a relationship? is there a relationship between pneumonia and smoking? So yes, actually. If I remember sorry, correctly. Sorry, Jose, Jose, there is. Yeah, sorry about that. Don't smoke. <laughs> 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 um, but it, pneumonia is primarily an immune response to an infection that causes inflammation. 
And basically, the immune system of our lungs is incredibly strong. It has to be. It's one of our vital organs. But smoking kind of kills the cells in there and causes a lot of disease, not just pneumonia. Pneumonia being one of the more common ones that actually allows people to be more viable to. This is going to be a little personal because I did have a neighbor who was a heavy smoker that died of a very bad case of pneumonia um, about a year ago. And we honestly think he didn't survive because he smoked. It just kind of weakens weakens your entire lungs, weakens your breathing, weakens your immune system. It's just not a good habit. (laughs) And um, Hugo is saying there are many other uh, applications of this project. And uh, the cool thing is you can actually read about uh, Benjamin's project in the first place and um, start building and training the data for anything that you want. I can't emphasize this enough. We have Caleb uh, find one very good use case, but you can um, create the same thing with your own use cases. You can take, you can create the same thing with your research and, or you can take a version of mine, put it on steroids and make it better. The pro- the point of this is I wanted to be able to spiral out for other people to do it as well and have it to a sense, which is everyone can do it by themselves or do it with a team. It doesn't matter. They can develop it and contribute to the whole problem by themselves in some way. I think you're inspiring a lot of people. uh, (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely inspiring me too. And I think it's actually super important for uh, all our our viewers. It it sounds uh, cheesy to to say that, but uh, if you're inspired by the the story, technology um tell your friends like it's not like it's not i don't want you to like just uh, tweet our stuff just because like that makes uh, us happy uh, as microsoft employees no it's just like that's the right thing to do like you i'm pretty sure most of you had no idea that this was even possible just like back in uh, may of 2020 when i just started playing with the sensors i had no idea that in just a matter of hours i would have a device that would um, tell coffee apart from whiskey and things like that and like you need to, you need to share the story like it, as soon as the recording is is available like t- tell your friends have a look at the if you're more into programming yourself have a look at the code um, and learn learn a bit about neural networks if you're uh, not uh, fully up to speed just yet if you haven't played played with arduinos just yet that might be a good excuse as well but yeah that's um yeah but I guess that was what I wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, one more thing I want to add to that is, uh, like, if you are curious and if you can think of a use case and don't want to build it yourself, let us know too. Like, just tweet yeah. us because um, we do want. I mean, we are looking for new use cases and want to extend the project um, and talk about it. Just okay. So I'm going to address that question on screen real quick what what does Caleb plan to study in college if he plans to go to university I don't know (laughs) I have no idea in the world this is just something uh, I was like I have a personal experience in this and it seems like it's a challenge but it seems like a fun challenge so well yeah and you haven't even explored coding enough so maybe you'll decide to be just a software engineer and do these kind of stuff but by the, way, I, by the way, I have, um, I believe, six minutes left. Um, uh, I mean, you can stay if you have the time. It's up yeah, I, I, I think I have time, but let's see. <laughs> I would say within the next 30 minutes, I have to probably go. Okay. Uh, yeah. We don't want to keep you away from your uh, schoolwork. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Although I don't think that he's missing any schoolwork since the entire school is watching, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> And uh, I, I hope it's not the whole school. That would be a <laughs> more stressful. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have four thousand viewers live, as oh, far as wow. I can tell. So, well, that's not sure. Yeah. <laughs> but we have a lot. <laughs> and if there's any other AI projects that you guys are working on, just let us know. You know, we want to hear yeah. about it. <laughs> All right. So, um, I would say. Yeah, I'm just going to add something on to this real quick. I actually have a couple of post-its I wrote for myself real quick just to keep me on point. Um, let's see. 
That's my best. <laughs> Let's see. Something. Yeah, about the power. Let me see. Okay. Yeah, I don't need that. You need to learn edging. Okay. So, first of all, I'm just going to say right now, if you want to try anything in like this, I'd, I'd actually recommend starting off simple. Very simple. <laughs> because let me let me get this out so what is it called edge impulse i would actually recommend because it's a very easy and e platform to learn and it can basically give you you it can interpret your data and it's not just about let's say enosis in fact act a lot of the applications have to do with motion sensors or sound recognition or a lot of things and that can be just a very wide range of things a program can do and can make ultimately your life in terms of things easier. So I would say learn edge impulse, make your life easier. <laughs> Start out simple. Oh, oh. And a lot of the programs are really kind of just interactive. They help you. you know, they get everything well, good. <laughs> in a sense, I don't really know. I really have the words for it right now. But I guess thank you guys. Um, any other questions? I'd be honored to answer them. Just I'm really glad I'm here. <laughs> we are too. Um, also to Benjamin too. Um, if the key can answer, especially more specific question related to Azure, as well as how you get started. Um. So. Benjamin, I, I want to ask, oh, okay, we have a question. Um, oh, yes, actually. I love, I love um, the, whatever just got displayed here, which is his nose connect many applications in factories and facilities. No, I was right, factories and mines when they need to monitor toxic chemicals. Yes, because there are actually many different like sensors or things that measure very specific um, chemicals in the air that could be incredibly deadly to humans if, well, breathed in. However, from my understanding, many of these sensors are non-cost effective for the companies and or the individual person that has, a, that has to use them. So that actually would be an interesting application to look at. Let's see, do you recommend working on working for, for, for some reason, that, that makes me think about, um, have you thought about um, uh, improving the... Um, the quality of the of, of the predictions and of the diagnosis by yes, potentially I've, I've adding computer absolutely. adding computer vision like adding like here's the x-ray of the lungs here's the breath sample what is the what does the two uh, give us in terms of uh, uh, of, of a prediction right because maybe the x-ray is kind of not clear the, the breath not clear either yeah. but the combination of two could be uh could be where you you find i would the, not uh, i would actually not use that sample i would say like something like um a sputum test and the other thing because x-rays are found to actually see if someone has pneumonia mm -hmm. sputum tests are trying to identify the strain of it so you can probably do a rapid sputum test with um the enos and allow it to basically see you know this is most likely the thing because the results are both unclear, but they a point to something. Because, for example, bacteria is mainly the basically the only one, and that sputum can detect. So if that knocks off the board, but then the, and you know, let's say it doesn't come out clear and or it just says, oh, it's not fungal pneumonia for now, we can just know, boom, viral. And then treat it with anti-viral. So it's you are right. It would be an amazing combination. I saw a question earlier saying, would you recommend working on a team? Yes. Technically, I have worked on a team on this, which is I have people like Benjamin. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then I have everyone here allowing me to have a platform here. So this is all a team. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend and working as a team. Um, like some city has a higher lots of we, we have a question <laughs> from from Jose, which I think is for you, Caleb. Which deep learning architecture are you using? Are you using ResNet or what kind of? <laughs> no, maybe I take that one. Um, so the I'm the, using the neural net, yeah, TensorFlow. Oh, I think it, wait, it's not just TensorFlow. Sorry, it's TensorFlow Lite because yes. I'm using it on a microcontroller. So right, 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually a good um, uh, a good first uh, part to the answer. It's the architecture. Um, I mean, the, the neural network at the end of the day it runs on a microcontroller that has really really uh, little amounts of uh, memory. Like we're talking hundreds of kilobytes. Uh, same in terms of um, of flash of storage, right? So the model needs to be small, um, and it doesn't. It, it needs to not require too much uh, memory to to run. And so the architecture is actually really uh, simple. Um, and maybe if you have a few minutes, actually, uh, Caleb, do you want to show? Or I I will actually. I think I have a yeah. um, a tab. Um, it might uh, yeah. It might be a minute. Du -du um. Yeah, the architecture is really, really simple. It's just a couple dense layers. So we take as an, um, yeah, briefly, I don't want to uh, eat too much time, but the the raw data from the sensors, um, so it's like literally just uh, um, at T0, what is the gas concentration of CO2, VOC, et cetera, et cetera, at T0 plus 100 milliseconds, what is the concentrations, et cetera, et cetera, which means that uh, you get um, uh, like those, you slice the data in uh, one or two second uh, windows. And from this data, uh, first step is to extract some key characteristics. So uh, it turns out that what your intuition might tell you um, actually works, uh, your intuition is probably or mine actually was initially that what characterizes a smell is what is the intensity of and the, like the, the the concentration of the, of the the gases right so the the average if you will of each gas concentration of the specific on the specific time window but also things like the minimum the maximum uh the root mean squares so that you can capture the intensity, like how much the um, the, um, the the gas compound uh, um, competes with the ambient air, maybe like right, you know, if there is a, um, uh, yeah, if it fluctuates a lot, then maybe uh, the, the the gas is more volatile uh, than than another. Um, if it goes up, if it goes down, like you can capture some pattern that way. That way, and so from those, um, uh, yeah, from the raw data, we extract the key characteristics average, minimum, maximum, etc., And then we feed them into a very, very simple, uh, like fully connected network, uh, where essentially the idea is just to, to correlate the input, which is the average of each gas, the minimum of each gas, the maximum of each gas on a specific, um, the concentration of each gas on a specific time window, correlate that with the predicted um, uh, classes, right? Like ambient air, limonene, nutmeg, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, yeah, training the model is pretty fast, actually. And at the end of the day, the model is pretty small too, right? Like when you end up exporting uh, the model for your um, Arduino kind of device, you end up with a model that fits in 20 Ks of uh, of flash, like all the, the parameters of the network, if you will, um, they, uh, they just require um, that uh, much. And then uh, you only require like just like two kilobytes essentially of RAM to do your inference at, at runtime, which means that on a small microcontroller, you can do it. And uh, interestingly, uh, you also have a, some hints in terms of how long the inference might take on a small MCU on a small 80 megahertz Cortex M4F. And it's going to take only one millisecond, which is actually interesting because if you remember the gas sensor readings, they are sampled uh, 10 times per second, which means that 90% of the time, the device can just sit idle and like go to sleep and save battery, save energy, because it's not like it's going to run full speed and, and just like you a video game would or a, a live video analytics um, algorithm would. No, it's, it's actually super, super efficient. Um, so yeah, I hope this answers the, the, the question. But yeah, the architecture is really simple. Uh, it could be way more complex. I, I've done some experiments and I've been talking to some uh, chemists and some folks who actually know their stuff about uh, perfumes and things like that. And there might be some like really interesting uh, things to explore where you have not one, but potentially several sensors, one really close to the, um, 
to the source, one slightly further, and then you can sort of capture the um, uh, the way the um, the smells and the scents, and the way they move in the air, right? Because you have the same sensors but spread apart, and you can build uh, maybe a, uh, an RNN, and you can um, add some more time into the into the mix. Um, but yeah, you can see the accuracy that we get even with the super naive model, right? Um, All right, so can I get my personal little two cents on that real quick? First of all, amazing presentation, Benjamin. <laughs> but um, yeah, it really does come down to the data being observed and how it's being gathered in terms of the methods, right? Because for my personal thing, I, w I somewhat struggled with some of the, uh, let's say, um, there we go. Model terpenes <laughs> is being like either, oh yeah, you know, this is the same or that's the same. And it really turned out it was because I didn't have pure samples in the beginning because I kind of got scammed by a company in the beginning saying they were selling, oh, 100% pure or um, bigger bergamotine. I was like, so I checked it. It wasn't bergamotine, especially the lemonine one. Lemonine, in, for example, this is the funniest thing. Lemonine is completely clear. It's just non, you can, it's like clear, but fuzzy clear, but the bottle they shipped it in, it was orange and yellow and it was separating into two separate layers. <laughs> but ultimately it really did come down to once I had the peer sample, the raw data that was being observed and placed into the neural network. And I really, I've been working on improving my personal neural network so it can basically find, you know, different anomalies in the system. So it would be like, oh yeah, uh, you know, what if a door just got opened in my house or a cleaner box was opened? So something that could uh, be able to deviate for it, but was still part of the data set, I've been adding to it in a sense for different scenarios to get the same data set and ultimately improve the accuracy. Yeah, that's really an, an interesting one uh, that I, I usually like to mention. Uh, the fact that when you train a... Um, a model to classify things well the model is can be super accurate 84 percent 99 percent but it's still really stupid in that you you feed it with uh, some input data and it's going to give you a result it's going to be like oh yeah it's whatever you gave me it's 60 percent blah uh, but if that thing that you fed into the model is not something the model has been trained on it doesn't care right it's still going to try and make a prediction. So it's uh, quite important to try and um, maybe train some other models on the side so that you can do anomaly detection. Be like, okay, this data that I'm just about to feed into my AI, it doesn't look at all like anything that I've seen during the training phase. So yes, maybe the model will make a prediction. Maybe it will be right, but chances are it won't, right? Because it's, it's just, uh, it just won't work, right? And so uh, you don't want that to happen when you build a medical device and you start uh, like dumping, uh, I don't know, like coffee on the sensor and then it says, oh yeah, it's someone was sick from pneumonia. No, it's coffee, right? So. Um, also, there was a question by Jose. Um, I know that you answered that on in the chat, Benjamin, but do you want to also answer it in the call? Sure, yes. Um, so yeah, um, the most uh, straight, straightforward path to connect um, an IoT device to Azure IoT is to use one of the SDKs that are uh, being made available. And so when you're looking at something like the Wii terminal, a microcontroller, you're likely going to use C. So you use the C SDK, which is what, what's being used uh, by the e -nose. And um, so yeah, it's pretty straightforward to, um, to, um, to start like exposing whatever data um, make, makes sense on your device uh, to expose to the cloud. You just use the SDK to do just that. And uh, effectively, the, the, the data is transferred using MQTT. So whether you use uh, Wi-Fi or cellular network or any other form of um, transport, the, the good thing is that 
thanks to MQTT, you're um, you're not eating up too much bandwidth, and you have um, yeah very efficient uh, communication mechanism that way, and something that works both ways too, right? The, the fact that you can not only send sensor data uh, from the device to the cloud, but also through the very same um, uh, channel, uh, the same MQTT connection, you can from the cloud. Uh, send um, commands to the device or uh, upgrade the firmware to a newer, ver newer version, upgrade the AI model, things like that, right? And yeah, MQTT makes that super easy. Uh, you're uh, muted, Icicle. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I keep like accidentally muting. Um, so, what is it called? I really okay. like MQTT for the reasons you actually did say, which is, you know, very it's amazing processing data but about the project ultimately i'm gonna be honest here <laughs> <laughs> this project was difficult for me to do i burned my hands from soldering trying to get sensors that didn't interface <laughs> i um i had and i had to go through an entire process of so many different failures Right. Yeah, tell us right. about that. Yeah. These process, like, I, well, the failure, I had a lot of different failures and a lot, and I had a lot of people tell me, no, <laughs> you can't do this. Um, well, but ultimately I kind of was decided to be stubborn and push through. And now I have this amazing, it's a, it's a hand, it's a handheld device, right? Wow. And it, it runs off of five DC, basically it's just five volts. There's even a battery pack you can install into it and make it run longer. And it's wireless too. So mm -hmm. <laughs> just, oh, wow. Just an amazing thing. I think, you know, it's just been able to just being able to develop it. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us what were, were the reasonings people were saying, don't do this or you can't do this? They said it was too hard and I wasn't going to be able to do it. <laughs> well, it sounds hard. It's a very, you know, tough question to answer, right? Yeah, it, it was ultimately, it, it, this was all like five months really worth of research and development. And just for me personally, because I'm just completely new to this, I was just kind of in the dark in the beginning. But every failure or every success led me just right here. <laughs> and I and what talk. made you, what made you like actually pursue it when you were hearing other people telling you don't do it? Pardon? Sorry. What made you actually continue with the project or, or kind of, you know, take on the project when you were hearing other people around you saying, don't do it? Like, what, what no was going your head? In my, in my opinion, no door is ever closed. You can do anything. You can do, I'm, I'm a 13, I'm a 13 year old kid. <laughs> and I, and I can, well, develop this. I can take inspiration from, I have just something bad that happened to me, which was pneumonia. And I'm like, if I can do it, anyone can. There's kids and there's people much younger than me that are that have so many amazing ideas that I know. And I, I would just love to see them be able to develop this. And I see all these like people just saying, no, don't do this. It's, and I'm like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I want to be able to inspire people. I want to be able to show that this is something they can do. And this is something that people can develop. And that was really the real reason I kept going on. Well, the fact that I got pneumonia, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good thing you got pneumonia. <laughs> if it led to all of this, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely inspired. I mean, uh, I want to admit, like, I wanted to do something with the sensors for the longest time. And every time I, you know try to read something i was like ah there's just so much i don't know and uh just close the book but uh, now i'm much more inspired and you okay go ahead let's do, take the question oh it's not really a question it's just that you know we are living in an amazing era right where we have access to all this information and and people can do cool things with it yeah yeah um, and here's your next project idea. Between <laughs> <laughs> Aaron and I, yeah, developing. Yeah. Well, you are also working on the robotics projects, right? Can you tell us about oh, that? Oh, um, yes. Actually, one of the comments earlier, I'm not going to reveal which one it was, was my robotics team saying hello to me. Um, <laughs> Our robotics team. 
Uh, I don't think they're still working on it right now, but some kids that are part of it might be there. I just want to give out an honorable shout out to some of my friends and the robotics team. Thank you for supporting me. <laughs> um, but let's see. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, I would say, where was I? I'm sorry. I kind of liked for a second. Um, but what, do, what do you do in the robotics team? Oh, yeah. So I'm part of a program. The primary program we do is a program called FTC. This is going to be off topic real quick. It's called FTC. It's a fun little program where, you know, you build robots and have separate ways to do, like, basically games with them. But it's competitive games um, with teams. Um, my teacher back there, Mr. Dev, actually is the leader of robotics for my school. And I'm actually the team president of it. I've worked yeah. decently hard on it, and it makes me <laughs> it makes me just happy to know that I have people supporting me. But we really just build robots, have fun, goof around sometimes. But yeah, yeah. either and I uh, might be useful for the robots. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And also for like somebody who was talking about how this is applied to the concept of digital twin. I think the twins are going to end up being less, a little less digital as time goes on, right? But if we start building noses and ears and eyes, <laughs> we're going to have actual twins, AI twins yeah. that we can touch. Benjamin, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> can you tell us more about the digital twins, actually? How does it uh, apply? Benjamin, you look frozen, actually. All right. Cool. Yeah. Let me put that question back. Um, I'm glad I can. I'm glad I can inspire you, Hugo. Pardon me if that's not how you pronounce it. <laughs> oh, Benjamin is left. <clears throat> oh. So, uh, I mean, I can try to answer a little bit. So, digital twin. The idea is, um, like having a kind of like a copy of the. Uh, well, Benjamin is here. Maybe he will answer. Hey, Benjamin, can you tell us about that? Benjamin. <laughs> yeah, my DSL box just rebooted or something. So I was off the internet for a few well, seconds. You froze very well. I mean, you were smiling. and I, I always fry, right. freeze very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you answer this question for us? How is the project related to the concept of digital twin? Uh, I can try. Um, yeah, so... Rather than digital twins, what I usually start with is um, um, rather than the IoT, how about we talk about the Internet of Signals? Like a device like the Enos, as soon as it's connected to the Internet, it can do things like whenever it smells something, it can send that information to the cloud, right? And so on its own, the device, when you like, when you look at it, when you look maybe at the, at its screen or at its whatever is the, the way it has to display the information, yeah, it's going to give you like some feedback if you are next to the device, but that's only a very simple signal. Once this signal makes it to the cloud, and if in the cloud you have um, modeled uh, how this device um, is effectively um, connected to the rest of the world in, in real life, then you can have uh, way more information. Uh, things like the Enos, you, you deploy it in the ceiling of uh, the restrooms of a particular office building, right? And so this information, you you model in the cloud, right? You, the device itself, it, it has no idea that it is on uh, floor number three of building 102, uh, of the Microsoft campus. But in the cloud, you have that information. And so when the device sends the data in the cloud, it can trigger uh, some particular, uh, some specific workflows where, oh, this nose just sent an information. Where is the nose again? Oh, uh, my uh, database, my digital twin graph tells me that it's there. It is, it's in this building. Oh, let's make a query to figure out for this particular building who's responsible for uh, doing the the cleaning today. Because like the kind of like the signal that initially was, hey, it doesn't smell so good in 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 the restrooms. 
this particular sig this particular signal that was just very basic, you can start composing it and like augmenting it with all the data uh, that you can get while you navigate the, the digital twins graph. And then you get to the point where you text uh, the person who was responsible for, for cleaning uh, the restrooms on a particular day, right? And this can all be super dynamic. The um, like based on um, the fact that maybe the, the person has, has called, in, called in sick uh, this morning, then maybe your digital twins graph will have a different information, right? And and uh, I should have prepared actually. I have a oh oh those again. Yeah, I will have in the back for it's, that. Uh, okay, oh, well, we lost. Yes, I hope you're back. Uh, that's you're interesting. Back. I hope that wasn't for too long. Um, <laughs> How, like, where, where did Just you lose me? Three seconds. Okay. Uh, so digital twins, it sounds like a buzzword. It's uh, in many ways, it's just a graph database and one that you leverage to, uh, yeah, to, to better connect the signals that you get from your physical devices, uh, connect those signals with the rest of your um, IT system and the rest of your information system so that you can, uh, yeah, do com potentially very complex workflows um, and very smart workflows as well. Like this idea of, yeah, it smells bad. Let's let's just text the right person so that they can actually go in the field and, and do uh, um, do that job more efficiently. That's right. That's kind of the idea. Um, you go, you tell me if that answers the question. <laughs> so Hugo says. Um, Yes, I mean, to, for, for digital twins to really shine, I guess, it makes sense when you have um, yeah, different entities, um, e-noses, uh, buildings, people, um, smart bulbs, I don't know, I mean, you name it, and all those devices, people, entities, um, you start like modeling what are the different um, kind of relationships that are uh, uh, between them. And then that essentially just means that whenever there is uh, some uh, particular events uh, that one or the other uh, starts firing, right? It might be the e-nose that says that it's uh, smelling something. It, it might be the smart bulb that says that it's running out of battery. It might be um, a person uh, that um, in, um, in your um, uh, global directory uh, switches from uh, being... Um, in, in office to being on vacation kind of stuff and all those uh, events you can uh, orchestrate uh, to uh, yeah to to create um, fancy reports to get uh, alerts to send uh, commands to the to the devices based on on what's uh, what's happening right a light bulb uh, starts um, telling you that it, it's it's getting low on battery not only do you text a, a technician to go and change the um, and change the battery but maybe you also like instruct uh, like from the cloud you send a command to the light bulb to be like hey whatever happens you're you're off for the time for the time being and uh, if you turn you on uh, locally it won't work because uh, we yeah we want to take that kind of a decision uh, so the, yeah that's the, um, that's overall the idea um, and that put the signals in the in three D perspective yeah that's a good way to look at it actually yeah um, yeah but uh, digital seven doesn't give you a three D visualization of it or anything it just um, have like allows you to uh, structure your data so you, these kind of relationships can be easily yes. detected. Yeah, the way, the way I understand Hugo comment, I think it's uh, it's 3D perspective as in uh, almost metaphorically, like it, it brings more perspective to the data, right? It, it has, um, yeah, you can, it has more more dimension. And, and yes, to your point, I school, uh, um, digital twins as in Azure digital twins, it's mostly just like a database and a set of APIs so that you can easily, um, uh, feed the data into the into this sort of knowledge graph and query the data uh, yeah. dynamically so that uh, you build your dashboards so that you build your web applications your mobile applications or maybe also your 3d visualizations right maybe you have a, a 3d model of um, of the building and you want in real time have a 3d view of how um, how good the air is in each room right you want this kind of, of dashboard and uh, this kind of uh, visualization that's 
It's only uh, possible. And actually, I'm pretty sure I have some code on GitHub that does just that. It takes the the nose uh, information and it uh, updates in real time a Blender uh, 3D model. Um, um, yeah, but I'll, I'll post the, 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 the link actually in, in the chat. Uh, but you can get it from the aka.ms AI nose if you navigate the, the GitHub repo. I think I have the, 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 the 3D model there. Yeah, because um, our, uh, you know, the marketing page does show like the 3D visualizations. Just wanted to make sure that, you know, that's something you need to do to uh, add. And it's not just a way of uh, visualizing. So it seems like uh, Caleb needs to go. Uh, uh, he, he does have school. We're yeah. Kind of so one very... before that, just like you were talking about. The DCS concept, Benjamin. There actually, I did actually see something yesterday. In fact, um, uh, I think his name was Scott something. One second. Uh, Anselman. Yes, Scott <laughs> Anselman. <laughs> and his um insulin pump, and oh, that's yeah. something similar to that concept. But I do actually have some thank yous I want to say before I go. Which the primaries is well, Edge Impulse. Seed, Benjamin Kabi, <laughs> my um, all my teachers at my school that are displaying it. Thank you, Mr. Dev. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're still here. Um, thank you guys for hosting me and letting me have a platform. And thanks for my mom, dad, and family for supporting me. As well yeah, as I was gonna say and bringing you to us today, driving you yeah. back and forth. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Yes. Thank have you. Yes, thank, thank you. Day. You so much. I hope to do something again someday and maybe be back here again. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Be <laughs> That'd be awesome. Good day, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Lucy. <laughs> any? Did you say questions? I was seeing if there's any questions. Does it seem like it? Well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Have a great day. Talk to you. Uh, this wow. is, was amazing. Aren't you so proud that you know your project inspired something like this, Benjamin? It's yes, it's it's, it's yeah, it's awesome. Uh, yeah. And I feel and actually, I should I should apologize on record. Uh, I think uh, Caleb mentioned uh, those people who said no or like it's not possible. I might actually fall in that category to some extent. Uh, in that, uh, probably back in December, he like Caleb emailed me through my blog or something and I just didn't see the email or didn't like really answer her and he insisted and he persisted and eventually mm -hmm. I was like okay well, like what kind of help do you need and uh and I'm glad I uh yeah we got to to talk uh, a few weeks back and uh it's amazing like it's um a really really cool project yeah it is really amazing and uh, how did you end up being on the cover of make magazine I mean, uh interesting just i guess that's one of those uh uh few times where social media works uh like the yeah that that weekend um uh, almost two years ago now when i initially started to play with the sensors etc i guess i yeah i tweeted about it and like did some um yeah, some tweets that um someone at make actually saw and was like hey uh, why don't you write a a, a story for us and that was kind of a great um, excuse, actually, to um, to finally get my uh, my stuff together. In terms of like, from day one, I wanted everything to be open source and to uh, to write a blog post or some kind of tutorial, uh, but I never took the time. But once they told me, hey, you know what, uh, how about you do an article? Then uh, I worked on that, and then I just played the um, yeah the French card. Do I have the cover? Yeah, for those who haven't seen like. Yeah, like it's um, nice. it's all about being the the, the French, uh, the, French, the French cliche. Um, but you yeah, know, it's 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 certainly inspired. Like this morning, I, I had someone from uh, China asking me on on Twitter. Um, he had some questions because um, yeah, he was trying to compile the code and stuff. And uh, yeah, it, it's been um, it's been great. Uh, like Caleb was talking about platforms. Uh, it's great to uh, like I've been I've been super lucky for sure uh, to. Yeah, to have such a platform. Yeah, yeah. follow uh, Benjamin on Twitter, and you see he answers questions too. So yeah, <laughs> eventually. Nice. And how's your sourdough baking right now? Did it improve? Oh, that's the thing. I actually never like so. 
the idea was that I would train a model, uh, like the input to the model. Like some people think that um, the nose, especially when they see the cover, that it's all about like actually smelling the bread. No, it's about smelling the sourdough starter and be like, you smell the sourdough, you capture the, the fingerprint, if you will, of, of the smell, and then you bake the bread and you give the bread a, a, a mark, right? It's like, yeah. oh, it's a nine out, nine, out, nine out of 10. It's super crispy, really golden brown. And then you that's how you label the data set uh, of, of the sourdough starter to be like, okay, this sourdough starter um, gives a bread that is nine, nine out of 10, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking May of 2020. And so like pretty much immediately, like I had the idea, but then I was like, but there's, there's not even flour on the shelves in, at the supermarket, right? Because there's no toilet paper, there's no flour, there's no, no pasta, no anything. So it's not like I'm going to bake dozens and dozens of baguettes to train my model. Because, well, I mean, even in, in normal times, it would take a lot of time to do that. But if you don't even have flour, then that just doesn't work. So the model, I ended up just training against more basic scenarios, I guess, just figuring out whether um, it would um, tell uh, whiskey apart from vodka, from rum, which I thought was already a good exercise because it's, um, I mean, when you have a sensor that's only able to, to measure the amount of ethyl alcohol in the air and things like volatile organic compounds, etc., will it be able or would it be able uh, to tell different spirits apart or would it just uh, completely like be like hey no this is like super strong in terms of alcohol and i cannot tell the difference well it could tell the difference so that's um yeah the, the, the model i initially trained on spirit and on booze yeah so i grew up in porto portugal which is known for port wine and basically everyone around me like all my friends in school whatever were related to the port industry in some way so like there's like there's like a big tradition of like all these people who kind of who could like smell the wine yes. and and detect is it good is it bad is it is going to be labeled as this or this or that is was was this a good year right so it seems like um this could also have applications in in that kind of industry right yes and uh we we were briefly uh, discussing that uh, with caleb earlier um my um experience is that um it might require way better sensors than the one you get from um, a couple dozen uh, bucks. But uh, but yeah, I mean, there's no, no reason why not. And one thing that I wanted to mention as well, I'm not sure how it probably could apply to, to port. Um, um, we tend to do a lot, like there was this question earlier about next is the eye or the ear. Sure, but sometimes it's also good to not do and um, not go too far in terms of anthropomorphism. That one is hard to say, right? Mm -hmm. But the um, it might not be just about the smell, right? Maybe um, detecting bad port. Um, maybe you also need uh, a color sensor or some kind of camera that that is an additional input that that you that that that's going to go into your ai so yeah maybe the gas sensors will give you some uh, kind of information but if you augment that information with uh, uh, what a color sensor would 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 give you or maybe um humidity right maybe the the humidity of the port yeah. combined with its color yeah, Even viscosity, yeah. right? Like how it exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, and then you're like, oh, I had no idea. Uh, only an AI could know. I had no idea that, in fact, what characterizes bad port is, yeah, the combination of uh, I don't know a, a color that's too dark and a viscosity that's just in a particular range. But only an AI could could figure that out. Um, granted, that you actually uh, go um, maybe and like think outside the box in terms of. Yeah, like for centuries, uh, people expert in port, yes, they, they rely on their nose, but there might be other ways, right? Um, right? Or maybe they don't even realize that, like they think they that's their nose that do the job, but in fact, they they look at the viscosity, like, like you said, right? Yeah. I really liked your example of uh, x-rays too. Uh, mm -hmm. When you suggested to Caleb, I know that um, radiology, 
has the highest uh, percentage of errors in any mm -hmm. medical field. And the reason apparently is because they don't get any feedback from, um, they look at the image and if, yeah. you know, they Except, say yeah. you don't have cancer, you, they never get the feedback that that person actually had the cancer or pneumonia or whatever it is. So uh, this is a great way to like uh, supplement it and give that feedback to the radiologist too, right? It's yeah, I think yeah, I think that that was exactly my point when I was mentioning it to, to Caleb. It was that, um, yeah, like the right now uh, the X rays uh, to to his point, uh, they're they're pretty useless in terms of figuring out what kind of pneumonia. Maybe like you you can figure out uh, uh, by eye uh, that there is pneumonia, but no doctor can tell what kind. But maybe an AI can, right? And maybe it cannot today but but maybe uh, yeah in 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 a few years when there will be enough um yeah data that will have augmented like this particular x-ray that we took a year back to two point ash um yeah we like we know what's been the, the history of the patient and it, it he's gone through cancer and he's gone through whatever um and so yeah and so that particular pixel on the x-ray uh, was important no no one knew but um but now the AI does. Um, Go ahead. I was just, I was just displayed this one because yeah, also the perfume industry, uh, it's, it's an obvious one because it's all about the smell, right? So. Yeah, there, yes, yeah. So someone actually reached out to me. Uh, so this time on Instagram, so that, that that's also one of the uh, uh, the collaterals of the, the make cover, I guess. But yeah, it, um, I don't know if you guys had knew that, but there are, uh, Python libraries and there are open source libraries for fragrances. Like there, there are some um, universal uh, ways to um, to describe perfumes, right? Like uh, a bit of limonene, maybe like like Caleb was using a bit of this, a bit of that, and like you can describe perfumes like very scientifically in a very re reproducible way. And uh, yeah, this person who reached out um, like. They want to like build uh, on, on top of those open source libraries and those open source um, ontologies almost of, of perfumes to see whether uh, you can also train AI to either recognize uh, fragrances. Holy, this is a channel number five, right? Kind of kind of stuff, or uh, or do it the other way around, right? Uh, dear AI, what is the perfume that I would like, right? What, what, based on or, or, my uh, or even right, like to uh, think about economics what is the perfume that will sell right yeah and, the and, and perfume is could be also like food related right it doesn't have to be just cosmetics it can be food it can be um cleaning products it can be cars right we, i think we, we all know that there are actually people who spend probably millions like designing what is going to be that smell of of the brand new car um yeah for sure. And so many people lost uh, their sense of smell during COVID too. So, you know, so we could just carry one of these around. <laughs> people who lost their smell can just carry one of these around and kind of have yeah. that so, age yeah, their yeah, yeah. senses. That, that, that's one of the, the, the stories and I had no idea. And there's an entire subreddit from people who, uh, so it's called anosmia, the, 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 this, uh, yeah, the loss of smell, which can be either uh, like, uh, for a short period of time, maybe due to COVID, but there's actually many people who just suffer from anosmia um, like all their life. And for them, things like knowing be, um, either with, sorry, Friday night here, knowing whether uh, their milk has gone bad, like they can't do it. Uh, and okay. it's as simple as that for them, like um, bad milk, um, food that's burning in the kitchen, uh, they have no idea. They have no idea, but um, it's actually a very, very easy uh, thing to uh, to train uh, the AI to recognize, right? So uh, uh, there are some low hanging fruits, and and for that particular use case, uh, like you were mentioning, carrying the device around, yeah, that would totally work. And like Caleb said, it can be battery powered, and for that one device. I have no issue at all with the twenty dollars sensors because I know for a fact that just for things so obvious for us uh, and for the sensor like bad milk or burning food yeah the, even a very basic sensor 
does the job. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it also helps with the large scale. If you have a warehouse or something, or if there's, you know, food is going bad somewhere, like you can't have people walking around and smelling things all the time, but, you know, this uh, helps so much. The sensors help so much in a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, uh, you wanted to learn machine learning and you were new to machine learning and we have an expert here, B, she's also a mathematician. Tell us, like, what was your journey? Uh, how did you get started? What was the hard thing about learning machine learning? Uh, yeah, a few things. I think one, so every, every time I wanted to go through some kind of like neural networks, 101, uh, dense networks, when, I mean, the basic sample usually, and it, it, it's probably super basic, but it's like, let's do um, um, pixel recognitions, like a single digit handwritten recognition okay that's probably like as simple as it gets i mean there are some samples that might be slightly more simple than that but i mean the the use case i understand but the the supposedly very basic math behind uh like the the very basic model that they threw at you in uh, in most tutorials that i was reading back then it was like for some reason i like it wasn't connecting in in in, in my brain and so one thing that helped i guess was having a super tangible use case like yes i mean recogni recognizing handwritten digits you might think it's pretty tangible but to me a smell and like something that i can touch is actually way more tangible than pixels uh on like a in a matrix like kind of structure um so there was that and um, I mean, we've mentioned it a couple of times, like the, there are some tools that, that really help these days, like Edge Impulse is one, but there's, there's many more uh, that sort of helped me approach the problem more in terms of, I don't care about neural networks. I don't care about dense layers, activation function. Like it's, now I kind of know what it is, but really I had no idea two years ago. I don't care about that. Like I only need to solve an equation that takes as an input the stuff that I care about, the, the smells, like in my case, the, the average, the minimum, the maximum of the gas concentrations, and as an output gives me a probability of, um, of and the likelihood of, uh, of, of, of it to be uh, such or such smell. And once I had access to a tool that could just allow me to approach the problem that way without having to think about the black box initially, um, it started to click in my brain because I was like, okay, neural networks, I don't care. Like it's really literally just a function. And then I started to uh, to manipulate a bit more the, the actual neural network. And I was like, oh, okay. So those neurons uh, and those connections between them, those are effectively the knobs that I, I would be adjusting again in real life. Like if I were to have, uh, the different gases going in actual tubes, right? I would be routing them based on like my uh, exper experiments so that if such gas goes in with just a bit of that one and, and a lot of that other gas, then it gets routed to this particular category of smell, right? And those, and I was like, okay, I now I get it. And uh, so that was how um, that worked for me. I, I don't know if uh, any of it made sense to, uh, to, to, to you guys, but in, in a nutshell, it's, yeah, I think um, if you get stuck at some point with AI, because uh, computer vision is in many ways, maybe the AI 101, but it's also really, really complex. Uh, there are tons of ways to do, um, to do deep learning and machine learning, right? And uh, there's tons of samples these days where you can just take a, an Arduino kind of device and uh, start uh, taking accelerometer data or temperature data and use this very very basic input as as the um, as the yeah as the as the main input to your neural network and that um, I think that really helps. Yeah, you're actually touching on something that Iskel and I have kind of touched on over like several shows in the past, which is like. It used to be that to do machine learning, you really needed to know a lot about machine learning. You need to know like how back, back, back propagation works and how to tweak everything. 
But I really think that those days are over. Uh, I think there's still always going to be people who kind of uh, um, want to learn those details because they're trying to push kind of the field forward in some way and find new ways of doing things. But I think that for most of us, most people that that are into tech, uh, there's there's better ways to not to use machine learning without reinventing the wheel. And and the reality is, all of us, even if we do know a lot about it we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel, right? If we're trying to do something that is simple and that or some, somebody else has already done and provide an API for it, that's what I'm going to use for sure. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think really this, this opens up like a lot of possibilities for people to, to do cool things with AI. Yeah, and and I think and I, I think Caleb um, like said that verbatim, uh, like k- keeps things uh, simple. Something else that I think helped me is that at the end of the day, I really had like just four guesses that I was measuring. Initially, just like two or three different categories of smells that I wanted to identify. So the model is really, really, really small. And those knobs that I was referring to, like I actually felt like you were just talking about back propagation. I, so I kind of like, I know I knew what it is, I know what it is, uh, but with such a small model, I actually felt like I could build the machine in real life, like this machine that would have actual pipes, right? With with the, the gases going in and then being routed in some in, in such and such direction. I, I almost felt like, yeah, there's just like maybe a handful of knobs. I could train the model manually. And that's, that's what is, it is about, of course, then you can have way more complex architectures where you start losing track of what's really happening, but when you have a model that's literally just two layers, one with eight uh, neurons and one with four, then you're like, yeah, I could build that in real life. Or like, I'm, I'm referring to pipes with gases, but it could be uh, more, like in my brain, it could be like something more vertical and you have, you know, sand that's flowing. And based on where you're routing the sand, most of the sand will go one way or, or the other. And it's that's how you train the model. And that's how you can also look at how you've, uh, positioned all the knobs and be like, oh, okay, so th- that's the kind of relationship that I've identified uh, between things that I had no idea were in fact uh, correlated, right? So, um, yeah, so you have a deep dive into my brain. Uh, how about that? I love that send an al- analogy, by the way. It's brilliant. I just want to answer a very, very quickly and very superficially. A question from uh, Hugo, and absolutely is not a dumb question. It is a question that people ask all the time. So AI is more like the over kind of the the bigger field of, of making kind of machines think like humans think logically, uh, and machine learning is one way of achieving that. And and today they're kind of synonyms because machine learning is is considered today to be the best way of doing AI, but that hasn't always been the case. Machine learning is more of a newer field. So before machine learning, there were other techniques that people thought were the right way to, to for computers to kind of achieve that, that kind of apparent intelligence or human-like intelligence. So these days, I think you can kind of uh, just think of them as, as the same thing. Uh, and when we talk about AI and machine learning uh, at, in Azure, what we are talking about when we say, I mean, AI in general, are ready to use uh, APIs like cognitive services or applied AI. And uh, when we say machine learning, uh, everything that be, has been talking about, all the tools that you could use, uh, right, to have your own models. Right. Models. Yeah. Exactly. So we have a question also from Hugo. And yeah, you answered this question before. I uh, think. That's right. I thought it apply. It was like as it applies to the Nose project in particular. Uh, but yeah, you do need to figure out what algorithm is better for application. That does require a little bit of knowledge. But there are also tools, including in Azure ML, that will pick that algorithm for you, uh, where you can just say, you know, hey, just just give me whatever the algorithm, whatever algorithm is best for this particular application. So yeah. So if you even if you're doing things kind of by hand, the Azure ML way, there's still kind of tooling that will help you uh, uh, do better. Yeah. Um, That brings me to uh, my 
mission today of telling you about 30 days to so learn. For, no, no, first you need to answer like, so was that the best AI show? Because you, you guys were like, it was. I, I already know this, this is going to be the best AI show. <laughs> I honestly, I was just thinking that in my head, I'm going to tweet the, that this was the best AI show because I think it was. Uh, what do you think, yeah. Ashley? Uh, we met with Caleb uh, before and talked about it, and I knew that this was going to be the most fun one. Uh, yeah. I mean, Seth has amazing shows. Uh, I'm now counting his, but <laughs> definitely my favorite. The best of ours. We can yes. say that, right? Yes. Yeah. And Certainly we did the most very, inspiring. Very good episodes. Yeah. Where we talk yeah. about the networks and everything. I think the most <laughs> inspiring, also, right? That that I feel like we as adults sometimes need a little bit of a kick in the butt to make us think that things are possible. Like, I think we're very quick to, to kind of think more lo logically, but sometimes destructively that this is possible and this is not, therefore I'm going to pursue the thing that's possible. And I think it, it sometimes it kind of, you need a kid to come in and say, no, anything is possible. <laughs> and you say, well, that's silly. And then they go, they do it. It's like, well, maybe I should kind of start thinking a little bit more like that because like the more you open your mind to the possibilities, the more you end up achieving, right? So I think that that's really how, like how this show inspired me and how I'm going to start thinking a little bit differently in my own project. Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing yeah. him to our attention and thank you <laughs> for creating the project in the first place. Uh, yeah, sure. that was cool. That was really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your mission, what's your mission? Yeah, first um, let me talk about next week sets uh, yes. have Alvin Clark and Paul DiCarlo, who is our uh, co-worker, yep. uh, talking about NVIDIA Deep Stream Development Microsoft in Azure. I don't know what that is, Ben, you might know. Uh, sorry, I was distracted. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, NVIDIA Deep Stream, um, last time I checked, uh, essentially a set of tools from uh, NVIDIA to help with building um, uh, video processing pipelines. So like when you want to do um, real-time classification of HD video streams uh, on like super beefy GPUs, um, that, that's what you need, right? And it, it helps really uh, decompose the problem so that you can like maybe do like very basic classification on the um, on the full image, right? And you just do person detection. And then once you've done that, this particular section where you detected the person, you maybe you feed it into a more complex, but slower uh, model. Um, but yeah, uh, it allows, it allows um, just that. Uh, and the, the, the integration at that poll is gonna demo. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be also about how do you operate and manage those uh, pipelines from the cloud, right? Because when you have um, devices like Azure Percept or things like that um, de deployed uh, in factory floors and so on, whenever you have new versions of your AI model that you want to uh, deploy, you don't want to do it manually, right? And go with your USB stick or things like that. You want to do it, um, um, yeah, the IoT way. Yeah, I want to say it's uh, building the eyes for it helps you build the eyes for that nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> for Caleb's robot. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about the show. Um, yeah. And there's a blog post that you can read if you're curious, but definitely tune in next week uh, at 11 a.m. PST, Pacific time. And finally, my mission <laughs> uh, 30 days to learn. So, um, we have a, um, what would you call it? We have a uh, great thing going on at the moment. Uh, we, you can start learning in February and uh, we have a path for you designed to learn about AI and a little bit of machine learning as well. And uh, while you're doing that, uh, once you start, we have a timer that start to click. And at the end of it, if you uh, sign, sign in, first of all, and if you finish them, uh, I don't know how they decide this, but you have a chance to win 50% uh, off from Microsoft uh, certification exams. So you can take the exams uh, after doing these. And it, it applies to different things. Now I'm seeing here. So um, if you go to that link and start up, so let's look at the AI one. Get started. Um, 
I already started it. <laughs> I'm uh, one of those uh, who started it. So we have all kinds of different modules that you can, you can start to learn. Just talked about them. This talks about all of the different um, different services that we have for AI and how you can use them. We talked a lot about anomaly detection in this show today. We said, um, you know, you can get the sensor data and then if there's an, any anomalies, something going wrong, we can detect it and send uh, send a message. Uh, anomaly detection service does that. Computer vision, we talked a lot about. You can detect uh, different things, um, people, uh, certain diseases if you train for it. Uh, and natural language processing, this haven't come up. This uh, la natural language processing helps uh, you to have a sentence or a word and then you can uh, understand the meaning of it. So it's different than just listening and, for example, t uh, transcribing a, uh, what you're saying, which is a speech service. Uh, natural language understanding gets the meaning out. out. Uh, we have conversational AI that allows you to create bots uh, or maybe uh, customer service uh, bots. And then uh, this first one talks about challenges and risks of AI, how to um, be fair, how to <laughs> eliminate bias if you can. Um, so this is the very first one. So overall uh, introduction one but the rest of the learn modules have code that you can run uh, directly inside these learn modules and how many of them oh there's a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah um, i hope you start uh doing the challenge uh this month and yeah, and I'd like to just add something to that is that what, what I think is cool about this a Azure AI fundamentals path is that it it gives you a full overview of both the the more like uh, manual way of doing of crafting your models like more like the Azure ML way of, of creating your models, but also like the cognitive services APIs that you can call if you don't want to go so bare bones. And so it gives you like that kind of vision that we were talking about earlier that you can kind of like uh, go a little bit lower level or, or, or higher level and, and not reinvent the wheel. So knowing what is available at the higher level is important, uh, even if you're an expert, because then you know what you don't have to do from scratch by hand every time. Yeah, right. And you save time. <laughs> Who doesn't want to prototype really fast and figure it out. And plus, you don't need data to use uh, Azure Cognitive Services, right? The data is trained already, which is a big part of it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's and totally it. We have asked on uh, the chat, uh, please do apply to Microsoft. We are hiring all around the world uh, and come work with us. <laughs> yep. Uh, wherever you are. And um, if that's your goal, uh, starting to learn about all of the Azure services maybe is a good way and getting the certification is uh, might be uh, good for you, not only to learn, but also like figure out like what you want to work on, right? Yeah. And also to put on your resume when you're applying for jobs. Yeah. Say that you've done that and that you know yeah. that. Yeah. Ben, how uh, long have you been at Microsoft? Oh, sorry. We have, we have two minutes. So I was just asking Ben and you and if you guys have any closing remarks including how long you've been at Microsoft. <laughs> uh, so looking at the calendar, in 10 days, it will be exactly three years of time. Nice. Congratulations. Nice. And it's um, Ben and I, uh, we met two years ago around this time. So it's our friend anniversary. That's true. Yep. Yeah, when... we met in Holland, out of every place. Yeah, when we could, I mean, yeah, we'll travel, yeah. stuff like well, that. One of the yep. last person that I get to hang out before pandemic. Nice. Yeah. Um, any other thing that you're working on and you want to share? Um, and any other things that you want to say about the AI knows, Ben? No, I mean, like, I really meant it when I said, uh, folks, and I, I saw a few of you in the comments, uh, I think you're genuinely inspired by what, what Caleb did. Um, yeah, talk about it, like, or like d d dive a bit deeper into some of the 
the, the source code of the of the artificial nose. Stay tuned for what what Caleb, I'm sure, is going to be blogging about and 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 sharing in the future and uh, uh, and yeah, and, and spread the word because uh, like I like I like two years ago I had no idea about how to build an an AI model and I'm a software engineer and I've been doing this job for like 15 years or something. So and maybe I just I'm just terrible at math. It's probably true and probably there's a bit of that but then that's only part of the the, the problem right there's like i was missing a few a few keys maybe and uh maybe sharing the original <laughs> artificial nose uh, um, helped um, a few folks and it certainly helped caleb and now caleb is gonna uh, open a few more doors for for people i hope and 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 you too by by, by sharing yeah. uh, by sharing the word right yeah, uh, we might have been kicked out from YouTube because I think we were like we yeah, need to end, exactly. end but the show. Happens. Interesting. Uh, no, we, we still have the recording of it. Like um, somebody was making comments. It still says about, live though. So yeah, cool. I think Hugo was commenting on uh, he regrets not having a, a tech degree. I don't have it, and uh, I'm able to build all of you know. Uh, AI uh, infused applications because it's so easy to use them now without being an expert. And Caleb certainly doesn't have. Yeah, that. he's still like he, he knows exactly. nothing about coding, like literally nothing. And yeah. Um, yeah. so, um, just remember him, be Caleb. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. oh we should be the new new hashtag, new tweet. <laughs> well, yeah, we need to ask to ask him and maybe. His parents, his, his parents, parents. Uh, but we need a T-shirt. Yes, be Caleb. That's uh, with, with a big nose or something like that. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for coming, Benjamin. And uh, yeah. you made this uh, episode happen. And this is our favorite, really. We loved it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Uh, take care, and yeah, take care, everyone. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.